Good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, my name is Donald Kassan. I'm the uh, chairman of the Energy and Environment Division, and I'd like to welcome you here this evening uh, to this, our first uh, evening lecture of the 2014-2015 uh, series. So I suppose uh, it's the start of a new year, both uh, for our lecture series and uh, some of you there from the gas industry I see in the audience will know that it's the, uh, the start of the gas year. So happy new year to you all. <laughs> So about the event, uh, the presentation this evening is, um, will focus on the future role of gas in Ireland and the EU and will uh, outline uh, energy security challenges facing both Ireland and the EU in the context of a high reliance on imported natural gas. So um, uh, the presentation came from a recent e-insights paper which uh, uh, was published during the summer and uh, Paul has copies of here for, uh, for anyone who wants one, uh, and it's a very interesting paper. Uh, you know, even if you're not involved in the in the gas industry, it's a it's a very interesting paper from the from the perspective of general security of supply. So the speaker then is uh, Dr. Paul Dean, who's a senior researcher with UCC's Energy Policy and Modelling Group. So Paul has been working in the energy sector for 10 years in both commercial and academic research in Ireland and abroad, and. Uh, he was telling us before the event he's also an expert on the SEM, so if anyone wants to ask him any questions on that. And uh, so the Energy Policy and Modelling Group in UCC uh, do a lot of good work, and I see uh, Dr. Brian Agalacor here as well. They do a lot of work which informs uh, energy policy both at national and EU level, and uh, not a lot of people are aware of that. So, you know, the e Insights paper is probably a product of some of that work, Paul. So. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, the lecture this evening, so without any ado, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Hello, everyone. So to produce one, meg one, one megawatt hour of electricity from coal creates about one tonne of CO2. To create one megawatt hour of electricity from gas creates about half a tonne of CO2. To heat a typical Irish home with oil generates about four tons of CO2. Same house on gas, just over three tons of CO2. To power a vehicle with compressed natural gas, produces somewhere between 10 and 20% less CO2 than conventional diesel vehicles. In Ireland, 100 hectares of Irish grassland will produce enough biomethane renewable gas to power 500 vehicles. So it's for these reasons and some of these reasons that gas is seen as a bridging fuel between uh, as, as we move as a global community from a, 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 which relies on uh, hydrocarbons towards a low carbon economy. Um, and we see this being played out at a global level. Uh, in the States at the moment, while in Europe we're very worried about where we're going to get our gas from and, and gas securities, the States are experiencing a gas glut, an excess of gas um, production within the states itself. And all this primarily came about in the states because of the shale gas revolution, which completely blindsided everyone, blindsided all the experts. It was a bit like Dublin not winning the All-Ireland this year. Everyone was completely shocked and surprised. And this has changed the global landscape and the global politics, if you will, because gas is very closely aligned with geopolitics. We saw in New York last week, President Obama making a very firm and strong speech about climate change. And if someone was to stand up here 10 years ago and say the US would be on their way towards possible energy independence by the year 2035, they would have been laughed at. Today, greenhouse gas emissions in the States are lower than they were in 1994 levels. This creates difficulties for Europe in terms of where that excess fuel that the Americans are not burning is going. And also, it ch makes things challenging for Europe in terms of competitiveness and in terms of environmental challenges. So this narrative provides the backdrop, if you will, to some of the elements that I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about um, the future of gas uh, as we see it within the EU, and also I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we're doing in UCC that allows us, that informs us, uh, um, and allows us to understand some of the possible scenarios and some of the possible pathways for gas within the Irish energy system. Two small caveats before we kick off. 
There is no way we can talk about European gas within 40 minutes, not to mind the 20 minutes that I am going to uh, uh, allocate to it. So I apologise, we will not be able to talk about lots of interesting things like what's happening in China or Iran and EU at the moment. Also, because we're talking about gas, uh, which is a very reasonably technical issue, there's lots of units, data, facts, figures, trillions of cubic metres, billions of cubic metres, megatons. So I apologise for all that. So please hang on to your seats. Uh, if you can't hang on to your seat, hang on to the person next to you because there's going to be a lot of data and facts thrown at you. So we're kicking off. As Donald said, what informs a lot of our part of the, the work that we're doing at a European level is part of a think tank that UCC are involved in called Inside E. And Inside E is a collection of research institutes and universities around Europe. UCC are in there as a college, uh, University College London, um, Stuttgart, Stockholm, and there's a number of other uh, um, reputable insert research institutes, IFRI in Paris uh, and Kick Innovate in, in Brussels. And we are an independent think tank to provide policy advice to the European Commission. And part of the elements that I will speak about tonight are drawn from one of those uh, topics that we uh, that we looked at um, um, over the last over the last month in terms of um, in terms of gas. So first of all, to understand the uh, the regional situation about glass, gas, we need to step back and look at the global situation. Where are gas reserves at the moment, and who owns uh, these gas reserves? Globally, we last year we used about 3.3 trillion cubic meters of gas. Proven reserves for gas, including some unconventional uh, shales, accumulate to about 160, 186 trillion cubic metres. So there's proven reserves for about 55 years of gas out there at the moment. And I will say these are proven reserves as defined by the British Petroleum Statistics. It does not allow for sceptical, anecdotal or even mythical gas reserves that we sometimes like to talk about in this country. What you see here, first of all, along the, the x-axis is there is no EU 28, there's no EU member state on this, uh, uh, um, on this list. The European Union is very hydrocarbon poor, very resource poor in terms of gas and in terms of oil. So if you will, this list really provides a kind of people or countries that you should be nice to if you want to consider, if, uh, if you want to consider your gas securities in the future. And we're seeing that playing out this week with the European Commission having talks with Iran. Also, as you said just in the intro, the states have a, massive, have a massive competitive advantage in terms of gas prices because of the shale gas rev uh, revolution. Gas prices in the states today are about half what they are in Europe and about a quarter what they, what they are in Japan. And this provides major competitive challenges for the European Union and for other industries. And because gas now is so cheap in the United States, what's happening is to to, well, primarily because of market issues, they're turning off coal fire power plant and switching over to gas. And we're seeing the effects and the implications of this here in Europe. This graph here shows the steam coal imports into EU member states from the USA over the last 10 or 13 years. And as you see, since 2007, as the shale gas revolution kicked off in the States, there's been a huge increase in coal exports from the US into EU member states, primarily UK, Germany and Netherlands. Now these states were already buying gas before, uh, or were already buying coal before, but since the shale gas revolution kicked off, that intensity has certainly increased. This, is a, this has resulted in higher CO2 emissions in member states such as Germany and the UK, and in Ireland to a certain extent. In 2012, greenhouse gas, uh, CO2 emissions from Money Point were 25% higher than they were in 2011. The graph here shows the value for steam coal, the same as is, 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 same trend is seen for, for metrological uh, coal, which is, uh, or, uh, which is used in, in industrial processes. So when looking at gas, we lo we're looking at here a, a graph of the main gas consumers within the EU. Naturally, the larger member states are the biggest consumers, and the largest consumers are Germany at about 82 um, billion cubic metres, Italy and the UK. Ireland, our gas consumption is around 4 billion cubic metres. Germany would be somewhere in the region of 20 times uh, higher than, uh, than us. It's also interesting to look at where actually these member states get their gas from. This, gra this, uh, this graph or this, this table with data from Eurogas 
highlights countries in red that have a high dependence on the, on the country with the, uh, with the, from the, the column on top. Russia supply about a third of gas into Europe. Norway, less than a third. Uh, North Africa and others supply the remainder. Countries that have a high reliance on Russia are typically the countries in direct neighbourhood of Russia, Finland, Estonia, the Baltic states. Um, Ireland, as you see there, has a relatively, uh, well, this graph shows it has been a zero uh, importation of, of Russian gas. But in reality, once the molecules go into the gas system, they can go anywhere. So it's, it's, it's difficult to say in a, 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 with exact precision whether, where that Russian gas goes. But you can say that Ireland has a very low reliance on, uh, on, uh, on, on Russian gas. Other countries that have a high reliance on Russian gas or imports uh, directly from Russia will be Germany, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that situation uh, in a moment. It's also interesting to, work, to, to look at, well, actually, how do different member states use gas? What modes uh, uh, of, of, of energy do they actually employ that gas in? Ireland is quite unique in Europe because we have, as you can see in the graph here, we have one of the highest dependencies of gas within the electricity sector in Europe. Last year, about half, just 48% of our electricity was generated from gas, and that's quite unusual within the European context. The UK, the electrical power system is all about gas. They have a huge reliance on gas for the power system. In Germany, the power system is primarily about coal. They have a lower reliance on gas within the power system. The UK also would have a very high reliance and vulnerability when it comes to exposure of gas within the residential and within the, um, within the commercial sectors, whereas France would have a much, rely much lower reliance on gas for power generation, but a high reliance on gas for residential heating. So this shows the profiles, if you will, of gas usage within just select member states here uh, within, uh, within Europe. Now, for all the media attention that we've been hearing about Russia and Ukraine in the last couple of months, for a continent who wants to wean itself off Russian gas, we're doing terribly bad because we've just peaked in 2013 with imports from Russia, primarily all, all through, through Gazprom. This shows the development of, uh, of, of exports to European countries, primarily uh, directly from Gazprom, since the 1970s. And as I said, peaking last year at about 161 billion cubic uh, um, uh, meters of gas. This slide here is taken directly from Gazprom. Gazprom supplied, as I said, 160 billion cubic meters. This is around 80 billion euros worth of gas uh, uh, to Western European countries. So the Western European countries primarily receive the majority of gas from, um, uh, from Gazprom. Central European states take about 21%. This is worth a lot of money to Gazprom. And we hear a lot of stuff talk in the media about the analogy of turning, on the, turning off the taps. Now, turning off the taps is in no one's best interest, really, Number one, there's a huge amount of money at stake here. And number two, the analogy of turning off the taps is actually quite difficult. You can't, it's very challenging to stop gas imports coming into Europe. The gas is in the system. If you, if you turn off the tap, pressure is going to build up in those pipes. You have two options. You can either flare that gas off somewhere along the way, which is technically challenging, expensive, and very unsafe, or else you can reduce the production at the gas fields, which are primarily in, in, in uh, northern Russia or in Siberia. That's also very, very costly and very, very unlikely. So this, this scenario of turning off the taps is highly unlikely, both for technical reasons, very, very challenging, very difficult, very unsafe, and also for financial reasons. So Let's look at the major supply routes for gas coming into Europe at the moment, and let's look at how that may affect us in, in, in Ireland and maybe broader throughout, um, throughout Europe. The, Ireland, as, an import, as, an, as, a, as a huge importer of, uh, of gas, we get most of our gas through the UK, through the Moffat interconnector. Now, the UK get about half of their own gas from indigenous production, and they get the rest from Norway and some, primary, and some of the remainders from mainland, uh, from mainland Europe. So Norway is a major exporter of gas into the European system, into the UK system. And the outlook for Norwegian production is relatively stable over the next five to eight years. There's no major new fields coming on, uh, but production is expected to remain stable, but with no significant increase in production, and that's important. Um, another big producer of gas within, the, within Europe Will be well. One of the largest gas fields within Europe is in the Netherlands, the Groningen field, field uh, in the north of the Netherlands, and this field has been experiencing great difficulties in the last number of years with seismic activity based around the, the drawdown of gas. And as a result, the field has reduced its output by about 25 percent 
and that's going to put a bit of a squeeze on Europe in terms of, of security of supply and remaining gas resources. But in general, the gas outlook in this uh, segment of, of Europe is relatively positive, and also in Ireland, within our own sector, we're going to have CORUB coming online uh, um, um, towards the end of the year, maybe early next year, and that will increase and improve the security of supply situation uh, within Europe. While the Ukrainian situation is important, the kind of things that do affect Ireland, it's not so much the, the uh, let's say, the, the, the nefarious geopolitics of Eastern Europe that affect gas in Ireland, it's more so the mundane things like weather in the UK, cold winters drive up gas demand in the UK because there's such a reliance on the residential sector that increases gas prices, this increases gas and electricity prices for us. The beginning of September, the end of August, EDF had to turn off two nuclear reactors in the north of the UK due to cracks in one of the, in one of the tanks. This resulted in a requirement of more gas-fired generation within the GB system, greater demand for gas, higher prices for gas, those prices were felt within the sim as, as a slight increase in wholesale electricity prices, again because we have such a high reliance on, uh, on, on gas coming through the UK. So these are the kind of things that do affect us. Another element that's important for us in Ireland, which is a good signal uh, for, um, for the, the way gas prices are going to go, is gas storage. These are storage levels as of yesterday, or maybe the day before yesterday. And as Donald said, today is the first day of the gas year, so it's always good to check in and see where gas storage levels are. Because of the very mild winter that we had in Europe during the year, gas storage levels are very high uh, and quite at a healthy state. Germany has got a storage for approximately 60 days storage. UK has got about two, we two, two weeks of storage. Uh, Hungary has been on a drive the last couple of days to charge their storage systems, and their, their storage is expected to increase over the coming, over the coming weeks. As you can see there, the Ukraine storage is not in a relatively healthy situation with a lot of capacity uh, uh, to be filled yet. This graph here just kind of gives another element of the storage picture. And storage is a really good, this graph shows the storage capacity as a percentage of national demand. UK have 14 day storage, but that's maybe 4% of, um, um, uh, of, 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 the, of, the of, the, of demand. Countries like Austria, countries like Germany, Slovakia have very high storage capacity. In Ireland, we don't really have any significant form of gas storage. We have Kinsale, which is relatively minor, but we do have storage in terms of alternative fuels for electricity generation, and of course, gas stored within the, uh, within the system itself. So storage is a useful facility for looking at mitigating against risk, of against risk of interruption. Unfortunately, in Ireland, we don't generally have the geological conditions that allow such widespread storage in some of these EU member states. So looking a bit more towards uh, um, Eastern Europe, um, which of course a lot of the media attention is correctly focused around at the moment, and the Ukraine situation, 13 pipes transit from Russia into uh, Europe. And about a third of these, five of these uh, pipelines come through the Ukraine, um, and the rest of them come through Belarus uh, uh, and some of the uh, some of the northern uh, some of the northern uh, Baltic states. Um, one of the big suppliers, actually, uh, well, actually, in general, what 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 this graph shows here, the arrows are improvements in the gas network since the last supply interruption, which was in 2009. And a lot has changed in this part of Europe since the last supply interruption. There's been a lot of reverse flow capabilities around Slovakia, around Germany and the Czech Republic, which allows gas to be moved a lot more efficiently around the system. Um, there's also been some new pipeline capacity. Most notably, the Nord Stream pipeline has come on board. Nord Stream is a, is a fantastic engineering feat, really. It's a gas pipeline coming all the way from the Gulf of Finland and Russia all the way down to Germany. Uh, that gas pipeline can transport 55 billion cubic meters of gas a year uh, into Europe and it does really positive things for security supply, particularly in, in, uh, in Germany. One of the interesting and unfortunate things around this pipeline is that it connects to another pipeline called the Opal pipeline. And because of European uh, competition law, which restricts uh, full access to pipeline, to full access to, uh, which, which, which aims to prevent companies having full monopoly on pipeline capacity, the Opal pipeline, which is operated currently by Gazprom, is currently operating at about 50% capacity. Uh, that 50% capacity is causing a bottleneck for the Nord Stream pipeline. So instead of Nord Stream operating at 100% capacity, it's now today operating at 65% capacity. 
The European Union are, supposed to, are, in the, are currently reviewing this issue around the, the capacity allocations. There's no other company in, the, in this area who can actually get access to that capacity. Uh, it's a big issue for Gazprom. It's a big issue for, a European, for the European Union. If that was lifted, you would be able to move a lot more gas down through Russia, into, down through Germany and into the Czech Republic and out into some of the broader member states. So there are things that can be done. If there was a supply interruption coming through Ukraine at the moment, the kind of things that would happen would be, maybe in a likely scenario, depending on how long that interruption is going to be, um, Norway can increase their production. We can bring more gas down through the north. We can maybe bring some gas in through, uh, uh, in through Nord Stream. Um, but it depends on how long the supply interruption will be and the storage facilities and the charging of the storage facilities within Europe. But in, in general, Europe is much better placed today than it was a number of years ago to deal with supply interruptions coming through, uh, through the Ukraine. Another aspect that's, uh, that's talked about a lot in terms of alleviating the supply dependency or diversifying, or diversifying our supply dependency in Russian gas is LNG. There's currently around 18 or 19 LNG terminals around Europe. The majority of them are in Spain, and Spain gets a lot of LNG from Trinidad and Tobago, from North Africa, different places, Qatar. Um, and these, th there are a number, there are a number, a small number of new LNG facilities being, uh, being built around Europe, one in Poland, one in Lithuania. But the issue around LNG is that it's a good idea as long as you can get the gas at a reasonable price. And unfortunately, what's happened in Europe over the last number of years is that Fukushima happened, the Asian economies are roaring, they're doing very well, they are willing to pay a lot more um, uh, for gas traded as LNG than, uh, than we are able to pay. And this has seen a massive decrease in LNG imports coming into Europe. A lot of some of the LNG terminals in Spain are actually lying idle, uh, looking, at, looking at maybe other ways to try and uh, ship gas through these areas. And it's very, very challenging for the LNG industry at the moment. There is currently a shortage of liquefaction capacity uh, in the globe at the moment. New capacity is expected to come online in Australia, Southeast Europe, maybe in the States. And this is expected to alleviate the situation for LNG by, 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 by maybe providing more supply. But the situation for LNG is relatively poor for the next five years as it takes time for this uh, capacity to come online. And this is a real challenge, not only for the LNG operators, uh, but also for the member states. But LNG is a long-term investment, it's a long-term capacity, and things may change in the future. LNG terminals in the UK have been reasonably successful in the last couple of months in, in attracting um, um, shipments from Qatar. Strong British pound is acting in their favour, and also the um, um, air conditioning demand, which drives electricity demand in, in Asia, has been lower than expected. And this has helped LNG imports come into uh, into UK, which indirectly is actually a relatively good thing for, for us here in Ireland. So just to conclude maybe on some of the European aspects before we jump into what all this really means for Ireland and the future of gas in Ireland. Big issue in Europe with coal at the moment. Cheap coal is choking the power system. We're seeing massive uh, increases in CO2 emissions from certain member states. And unless the ETS system is, is maybe got in order, this scenario is not expected to change in the, in the short term. Also in terms of reliance on Russian gas, there's no simple or quick solution to replacing a third of our gas from Russia. EU is more or less, it's like a bit like a bad relationship in certain regards. We're locked into this uh, um, um, situation with Russia. There's been a lot of talk about building extra pipelines, building extra capacity in Europe. But the 13 pipelines that are, that are coming from Russia into Europe at the moment are operating at about 50% capacity. Also, within the European Union, we have plans for energy efficiency. We have plans for renewables. All of this is going to reduce the demand for gas if we take it seriously within Europe. So the financing of extra pipeline capacity in the context of expected reduced demand for gas and also in the context of existing surplus capacity is going to be very, very challenging. Down here at the bottom is a quote from Gazprom's magazine. Just pulled it out this morning. European energy market is at a crossroads. Gazprom's export is positioned as the most secure and cost-effective option for Europe during a time of geopolitical turbulence. However, it's up to Europe to decide on their trusted and dependable energy supplier. So it's really up to Europe as where we go from here. 
So that concludes, in essence, the kind of the first half of this talk about things in a, um, at a European level. Now we're going to look at and introduce some of the research that we're doing in UCC, which helps us understand how we will use gas within the future, within the future Irish power system. And the type of modelling that we're involved with down in the Energy Policy Modelling Group in UCC is Integrated Energy Systems Modelling. And Integrated Energy Systems Modelling is quite useful and quite unique because traditionally when looking at the energy system, what we have done as energy planners and energy policy makers is look at one specific dimension of the energy system. Primarily in Ireland, we've had a huge focus on wind and on electricity and on renewables. But by focusing on one specific dimension of the energy system, such as electricity, you're not looking for optimal solutions coming from the other sectors, such as transport, such as residential, such as industry. So by looking at the full integrated energy system, it allows for a more optimal and more holistic solutions, in the same way trying to solve a Rubik's Cube by just looking at one side. You just get one side of the, uh, of the story. So Ireland... <coughs> Ireland is a member of an international energy agency implementing agreement called ETSAP, and Brian O'Gallagher here is the chairman, is the current chairman of ETSAP at the moment. ETSAP is the Energy Technology Systems Assessment Program, and within the ETSAP community, we build software models. Primarily, the two software models, which are long-term integrated energy assessment models, are Markel Times, and there's about 200 communities globally using the Markel Times mod suite of models uh, at the moment. So there's Times models for UK, Times for Russia, India, Canada, Brazil. And for Ireland, this is a real strong advantage because it allows us in terms of, uh, it allows us to leverage on a very strong knowledge base, both at an international and also at a regional level. And it also allows for very efficient uh, model, develop, model development. Over the summer in UCC, we've been using the Times model to assist Irish government in understanding and in negotiations around the 2030 climate energy package. And these types of models will be used worldwide for a lot of policy negotiations and policy understanding. So they're quite powerful and quite useful models. As I said, there's Times UK, Times Canada, Times Australia. Um, Brian decided to call our model the Irish Times model, which of course cause, causes massive confusion. So I will say it again, we have nothing to do with the newspaper. Um, but we do call it the Irish Times Integrated Energy Project. And the partners involved in this project are ESRI, who help us out with the macroeconomics and on the economics. We have E4SAM based in Italy, who help us with the modelling side. And we have Chagastin and UCD, who help us understand the implications of Irish agriculture and Irish land use, land use because Irish agriculture and land use are responsible for about 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland. And recently, within the Energy Policy and Modelling Group, we've added on a module onto the Times model uh, for agriculture uh, and for land use, which is, which is a nice new development. The, model is funded, the, the funding for this type of modelling is given, us, given to us by SEAI and Environmental Protection Agency. And we've been developing this model over the last five or six years. The model is operational and we still have some research uh, phases which we're going through at the moment. So how does the model work? Well, basically what the model does is that we take long-term macroeconomic scenarios from the ESRI. And from that, we develop an idea, or we develop um, um, uh, an idea around the, the energy service demand. So, for example, how much energy, how energy required for washing dishes, drying clothes, driving our, driving our cars, uh, tons of steel, tons of cement. And what the model does then, it has a suite of technologies. There's over 1,600 technologies within the model, such as heat pumps, cars, hybrid vehicles, power plants, um, well, wind turbines. Uh, and the model chooses the least cost technologies to meet those energy service demands. The model also includes technologies such as energy efficiency, insulation, windows, doors, and all these things. So it does allow for very powerful insights into the cheapest way to plan and to organize the energy system. The model operates also subject to constraints. Um, within the model, there is a restricted availability on biomass, on indigenous biomass, land use, uh, um, uh, wood resources. Um, there's also limited land use for things like onshore wind, offshore wind, and obviously there's cost curves associated with the pricing of these technologies. And the useful thing about this model is we can ask it different questions. We can ask it, well, if the energy, if the economy develops in such a way, well then what is the cheapest energy system? And again, it's because it's an integrated energy systems model, we look at energy in the residential sectors, in the uh, industrial, commercial services, agriculture, 
Um, so it allows for, we like to think of it as a multi-dimensional competition between technologies across space and across time. It's a linear programming model, um, uh, partial um, um, dynamic equilibrium. Some of the fundamental weaknesses of a model like this, and in fact, in most models uh, that operate within this space, or particularly most numerical models, is that it makes the absolutely terrible assumption uh, that humans are logical and rational and, and, uh, uh, and, and non-emotional creatures, which is a, which is a, um, a, a terrible thing to, to assume and an unfortunate thing to assume. So part of our job is actually reconciling the results, the, diff the, the, the model view of the world that the model sees through mathematics and through dynamics and reconciling that to policymakers and how the actual world, world works. But it's a very powerful model and we can also put environmental constraints in there. Uh, the issue of environmental constraints is quite interesting, and I'll get to that in a second. So what the model does essentially is creates results like this. This is the energy system in Ireland in 2012. Uh, these are Sankey diagrams done by our, our, our colleague James Glynn. Um, as you see, the huge predominance of oil within the energy system in Ireland, the massive reliance on gas for electricity generation, and also the contributions of coal, peat, and other fossil fuels. And it's interesting, it's interesting to look at where these fuels are actually being used. The majority of fuel in juice goes into transport. And this is very important for Ireland because EPA projections are showing that um, um, greenhouse gas emissions are expected to increase by 30% for the transport sector out towards 2030. And this is, should really be a closer area of scrutinization, a closer area of focus uh, within Ireland. We also see down at the bottom wind and other renewables. Even though wind generally dominates the energy policy debate in Ireland, it is a relatively small contribution towards our final energy consumption. The red box here on the outside shows the elements that we consider within the integrated energy systems model, which is generally 100% of the energy. My colleague James Glynn looks at the energy security issues around where we get our energy from. And we also have another suite of models around integrated gas and electricity modeling, which generally captures maybe around 30% of the energy consumption with Ireland. So with a model like TIMES, with an integrated energy systems model like TIMES, we can figure out, well, how will this picture change as we move forward in, times, in time? And how will this picture change in relation to certain emission reduction targets, renewable energy ambitions, um, our macroeconomic scenarios, our technology risks? So let's do that. What this scenario shows us here is an output from the model for the year 2050, showing an 80% reduction in CO2. Now just to caveat this, this is CO2, not greenhouse gas. Agricultural emissions are, are, are responsible, agriculture sector is responsible for 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions uh, within Ireland. So an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas is actually a 50% reduction Sorry, an 80% reduction in CO2 is a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas. So when we talk about renewable ambition, we must be very cognizant of the fact that emissions from agriculture are not so easy or cheap to remove within the Irish context. So this primarily focuses on the energy system. It's a reduction in 80% of emissions. And what we see here is the very strong role of gas still has to play within the 2050 energy system. <coughs> the gas goes towards the residential sector, it goes into industry and it goes in large quantities into electricity generation. In electricity generation, as we see in the next slide, this is primarily empowered because of gas CCS technology, carbon capture and storage technology. We also see biogas coming into the, uh, into the equation. And the biogas is primarily used in transport and also within the residential sector. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about gas within the roles of these sectors now, just over the next couple of slides. We also see the important change in role of, the potential role of bioenergy uh, within the Irish energy system. And again, just to caveat this, this is one scenario for one discrete scenario for the Irish energy system. The nice thing about a model like TIMES is that we can do multiple scenarios. We can look at different um, economic, macroeconomic perspectives. We can look at an optimistic view on the economy, a pessimistic, a dire view on the economy, and we can run the model and we can see what type of technologies, what kind of policy choices come out of the model. And we can also look at, well, what, what, what areas of commonality exist between these different, um, 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 between these scenarios, and you can, you can inform policymakers around areas of least regret. Uh, 
So looking closely, looking a bit more closely at the, uh, uh, um, uh, pulling out the gas results from this specific scenario, as you see uh, in 2010, gas consumption was somewhere around between four and five uh, megatons of oil equivalent. What's shown here in the next column is the business as usual scenario. Now, the business as usual scenario assumes that there's no emissions constraints and what drives the model here are just natural technology, changes in price, changes in efficiency. So there's no, let's say, environmental conscience really. It's primarily market driven. If we, uh, if we apply an 80% reduction in CO2 to the same scenario, what you see is a very obvious decrease in gas, but not so much. And what you're also seeing is that the different roles that gas can play within the energy system, within a future energy system, under this mitigation scenario. So what we're seeing is that from the bottom up, we see some natural gas being used in conventional power gen, but also a lot of natural gas being used in gas-fired CCS, combined ca uh, carbon capture and storage technology. We also see gas playing a very strong role in the residential sector, which I'll come to again in, in, the, in the next slide. But we also see gas making its way into transport, gas and biogas coming into, particularly into freight. Now, if we apply a 95% emissions reduction, we get a very different pathway and we get a very different result. These are not mutually excuse, exclusive pathways, and that's, that's very important to keep an eye on that. If we apply 95% reduction on the energy system, on CO2, which is almost a complete decarbonization of the, uh, uh, of the energy system, you see a much more reduced role for gas. And this is primarily because of, of the emissions and also because of there's a much lower role for gas CCS, primarily because of the residual emissions that would come from gas CCS actually not appearing on the cost optimal solution. And also what's important to consider is the difference in cost for the energy system between the 80% and 95% uh, reduction are orders of magnitude in difference of change. So Ireland needs to be very careful when we talk about ambition and in terms of, of costs around what we can achieve in terms of either CO2 reduction or certainly in terms of greenhouse gas uh, reduction. A 95% reduction there in CO2, I imagine Brian would be about 60% uh, in, in, in greenhouse gas. So looking a bit closer at, um, at, at certain areas of focus that we're, that's ongoing in UCC at the moment, this is a research question and a research paper that myself and Steve Heinen are working at the moment. Steve's a PhD student over in the ERC up the road here with UCD. And we're asking the question, well, what impact will variable renewables have on the gas system in Ireland? Um, in UCC, we've developed an integrated gas and electricity model um, covering, at the moment, it's covering Northwest Europe. And we're extending this model uh, over the next couple of months with a PhD student, Sean Collins, and a master student, Matthew Akiron. We're extending this model out to an EU28 model. And this type of modeling, integrated gas and electricity modeling under the European, over such a wide European expanse, will allow us to answer such questions as, well, what will happen if there are more um, 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 supply interruptions coming through the Ukraine or through different transit routes? What will be the impact of more renewables? And it's great to see an Irish university actually take the lead on this uh, and, uh, and, and, to be, uh, and to be flying the flag for this. So it's our 2030 model. It's a 15-minute resolution model. It's an integrated gas and electricity model. It does day ahead and stochastic. Uh, independent samples. Uh, this is an output from, the 20, from one of the slides from 2030 for the model. So this is focusing primarily in Ireland. What we're seeing on the slide on your left will be is the wind variation over Ireland. Blue is low wind speeds, red is high wind speeds. This is one week in January in 2030 at 15 minute resolution. Down in the bottom right hand corner, what you're seeing is the reaction, what the generation stack is doing within the power system. The big yellow block coming across there is what the CCGT units are doing. The stacks on top of that then are what the other units, uh, OCGTs, hydro, and um, um, some CHP units are doing as well. The line on the top, if you can see it, is the line that's been traced is what's happening at the flows, the equivalent flows to the Moffat interconnector. And if you watch what happens it, when the graph goes blue, which indicates a very low wind speed over Ireland, what you see is you see the CCGTs flexing their muscle in reaction to that, and you see a massive jump in the, uh, in the uh, flows coming through the Moffat interconnector. 
This jump in the Moffat interconnector flows are not purely associated solely to electricity generation because this low wind speed scenario coincides with a high pressure which coincides with low temperatures over Ireland which drives higher residential gas demand which exacerbates the variability coming through Moffat. So the question that we're asking is, well, can the existing infrastructure cope with this type of variability? There is uh, reduced gas flows within this scenario, but the compressors and all the other infrastructure is able to cope with this type of, of changing dynamic really within the power system. Uh, and we haven't got the answer yet. Uh, we're, 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 we're working on it. Um, but it's, it's coming up in a, in a peer-reviewed uh, um, um, paper just hopefully before Christmas. Um, another element that we're seeing um, within when we run this model is the vastly different operational regimes for conventional units such as uh, CCGTs and thermal plant. The capacity factors for the CCGTs from that scenario are operating at 34% uh, uh, um, capacity factor. So not only does this provide very strong challenges for the, for the power sector industry to, to come up with innovative ways to make money in these types of markets, but also for regulators to design markets that can ensure adequacy and security, particularly for thermal generation within the, uh, the power system. If you've been following the news at the moment, you'll see what's happening in Belgium. Belgium have taken two of their nuclear units offline. There hasn't been any new build capacity in Belgium over the last number of years, and they could potentially be facing into rolling blackouts over this winter. Very serious situation that's happening in Belgium at the moment because of lack of adequate thermal capacity. And this kind of scenario may be a forebear of what, what's, what we're seeing across Europe at the moment. RWE um, posted their first loss, in, loss uh, financial loss in the history of, the, of, their, of their company. So things are very challenging for uh, um, um, thermal generators at the moment to try and make money within markets that are primarily now dominated by low cost or zero cost uh, generation. Looking a bit closer at the role of gas or maybe the potential future of gas within the residential sector, this graphic here captures data, data from the CSO census for dwellings in Ireland that are either primarily fueled for heating by oil, gas, or electricity. There's three quarter of a million uh, oil-fired dwellings within Ireland at the moment. What our analysis is showing, and even analysis by the Academy of Engineers, will be that air source heat pumps are a sensible technology to look at replacing some of these uh, oil-fired dwellings with this type of technology. There are, of course, barriers to the rollout of air source heat pumps, such as commercial readiness, trained, skilled professionals who can install them correctly, and also in terms of cost. They're not re really uh, cost efficient at the moment. Another option for some of these oil fire dwellings uh, would be to convert to gas. There's over 100,000 dwellings within 20 meters of the distribution gas network at the moment. So that's 100,000 dwellings within the oil sector, within the oil area here. That, were in, that are within 20 metres of the distribution gas network. And converting these dwellings over to gas could have potential benefits in terms of emissions reductions and also some broader benefits. And looking at some of those broader benefits, what one of my colleagues, James Glynn, is doing down in UCC is looking at the issue of fuel poverty and fuel poor in Ireland. In 2009, 10 to 13% of households were affected by fuel poverty. That's according to SAI, uh, an SAI report. And what James is doing is quite, it's quite reasonable, quite sensible. He's taking uh, data from the census around, um, and this map here actually is shown for, a, well, I, think, I think it's one area in Limerick. He's looking at what houses are, are fueled by, by, by different fossil fuels. So for example, this graph here up on the top, up on the top is looking at houses that are primarily fueled by oil. He overlays the gas distribution network on top of that. So he figures out, filters out for houses that are near the, the gas network. And then he puts a deprivation index on top of that, which is a measure of fuel poverty. And what this allows for is a very targeted policy focus for, for not only emissions reduction, but also some social, some social uh, issues around fuel poverty. And this is a very powerful way of actually uh, for looking at cross benefits, not only from emissions, but also in terms of, uh, of, of easement of fuel poverty. Just to finish up on some of the other research that we're involved in within UCC is around the area of renewable gas. We collaborate quite a lot with Professor Jerry Murphy, who heads up the bioenergy group down in UCC. We've recently done a paper on looking at power to gas. And the concept here is primarily taking low cost electricity or even excess electricity 
um, using an electrolyzer, passing it through methane and produ producing, uh, um, um, uh, um, producing biomethane and then injecting that back into the natural gas uh, network. We just have a paper. My chemistry is absolutely appalling, so please don't ask me what that equation means up there on the, on the top left. But we just produced a paper on this, which is in review at the moment, the potential role of renewable gas within a smart uh, island system. And the kind of things that we are seeing is that systems like power to gas, of course, are very expensive. They're a little, little exotic at the moment, um, but they can play a role in maybe reducing curtailment and in reducing or uh, softening the variability issue, not only around uh, renewables, but also around, the, uh, around gas. So in conclusion, about the future of gas within the Irish power system. There's very serious, strong technical and financial challenges ahead, primarily for thermal generation. There is an important role for gas within the residential sector. What we're seeing within the 2050 results is primarily we're seeing a reducing in the thermal demand for, uh, for heat, uh, almost by half. This reduces the gas demand, but we're also seeing more dwellings connecting up to the natural gas network. We see a long-term role for gas within the, uh, within the residential, industrial and commercial sectors. But the policy pathway for gas is very dependent on our ambitions around emissions uh, and our emissions targets. And there's also technology risks around the availability of CCS technology, around bioenergy, our key technology risks. If these technologies are not available, well then the pathway towards 2050 changes quite dramatically. And again, these are not mutually uh, inclusive scenarios. And also in terms of policy, while gas does have a strong role to play in Ireland's energy future, it's very important that Ireland position ourselves correctly and adequately in 2030 to allow ourselves enough uh, wiggle room or maneuverability in terms of not locking into certain pathways, particularly expensive pathways, as we move out towards 2050 and towards maybe stronger uh, emissions reductions scenarios. So I'll leave it there and we can maybe take any questions if that's okay. Thank you very much. Institute. Uh, I should have said it at the start, this lecture is being uh, jointly hosted by the Energy and Environment Division and the Energy Institute. And after our question and answer session, we might ask David to propose a vote of thanks if he could do that. And the other thing to mention is the lecture is being webcast to uh, a few centres around uh, the country, facilitated by Engineers Ireland and uh, to in Cork by uh, Energy Cork. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, Energy Cork and UCC. So welcome to anyone who's online. So. Uh, I'd like to open the, uh, the floor to questions. We have a, we have a microphone. Uh, the people online will be able to hear you if you, uh, if you use the microphone. If not, they won't. So we just ask you to wait to, uh, to get uh, a microphone to ask the question. So um, look, I, I'm going to start it off because uh, there was one thing. You, one of your Sankey diagrams showed uh, oil exports from Ireland. Is, is that? Sorry. Isn't it? Listen to your own advice, is that it? <laughs> what, one of the Sankey diagrams showed uh, oil exports from Ireland, which uh, is a surprise, uh, was a surprise to me. So is that, I presume that's uh, uh, inputs and outputs from Whitegate, is that's it? That's correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th there's inputs and outputs coming through the refinery, but th that kind of, th that's more of a model result rather than something being actually realistic. It passes through the model, but it doesn't really have any implication on the results. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's and it's, it's, it's not, it's, uh, it's not one of the prime results really from the model it's more of a relic of the model yes. really um so it's not it's not actually impacting on, on any of the on any of the uh, any of the results so it's i wouldn't pay too much attention to that specific result about oil exports very good. but no but very interesting diagrams um paul a couple of years ago i remember there was a, a move to the decoupling of the gas price from the oil price i wonder can you talk where that is at the moment or is that still there or what's the future for that to be honest, within the, within the scheme of, of gas markets, I'm not too well up on, on where the gas prices are at the moment. Uh, maybe Donald actually might be able to um, uh, uh, maybe shed some light on that area around the coupling of gas and oil prices at the moment. Um, just, uh, you know, from a media report, sorry, but you're part of the microphone. Three strikes, apparently. Yeah, no, just from media reports that, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of contracts that were ba based on... Uh, on um, you know oil prices are now moving you know they're delinked mm -hmm. this is what we hear but unfortunately there isn't a lot of transparency mm -hmm. around that but the uh, you know that is what the uh, you know the media reports are on that so Jerry are you 
Jerry Duggan. Uh, Paul, thank you for a very excellent and informative lecture. Uh, just two things. One is the Sankey diagrams. I think they might be more realistic. I appreciate that they reflect uh, contracts, but in turn, given that the UK is importing half of its gas thing, I think the Sankey diagrams might be better if we looked at Ireland on the basis of where the origin of the UK imports were from. It gives us a little more understanding of exposure. Uh, in relation to the kind of 2050 scenarios, uh, it's counterintuitive to see uh, gas-fired CCGT CCS operating in the kind of regime you're talking about. And given the capital costs involved and the operating requirements, it would appear that you can either go down a, C a gas CCS route, which is a high level of gas dependence, uh, with a low level of wind, and possibly minimize your capex. Or you can go for a high level of wind and open cycle gas turbines. But it seems very difficult to understand a system with a high level of wind and a high level of CCS. Well, first thing, to take your first point, I agree. Um, uh, and as I said, our colleague James Glynn, who's primarily looking at energy security issues, has other diagrams in relation to where the UK does get that. Because, as you said, it doesn't tell the full story, particularly in relation to exposure and vulnerability from where those sources come. In relation to the gas CCS, what we're seeing there is we're seeing about six megawatts of wind within the, uh, uh, sorry, six gigawatts of wind within the, um, within the Irish power system, which in the context of the full energy demand is actually relatively, relatively modest. I think it's, it's, so it's still under 50% renewable penetration. The, 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 the results are um, around CCS are sensitive to two things. They're sensitive to the gas price and they're also sensitive to the divergence between the coal price and the gas price um, and the difference between the two. Um, we, we have done some checks on the technical capabilities and the technical specifications and the ability of gas CCS to operate in that type of regime in terms of cycling and in terms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of ramping. But it is probably something that needs to be looked at in, in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much. That was a very enjoyable talk. Just, I'm curious, you, you mentioned briefly that you'd been working with the Irish government in the run-up to the climate change negotiations. There's obviously a key focus on agriculture and energy and, and where the two meet. You had some very ambitious, I think, targets in terms of, of bio um, for, for the 2050 um, scenarios there. Given the determination and the economic um, sort of imperative of developing Irish agriculture, given the fact that we're losing, um, that we're losing the, the milk quota, how does that kind of match in with, with, with where you see sort of biogas in particular? Where, where are you going to, I suppose, get the, the product from? That's a very good. That's a very good question, um, particularly around the level of ambition. As so we, we have added on another module onto the integrated times model, which allows for the 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 insights to be gained around that land use competition. But it's certainly very very challenging, um, particularly the what's in the public domain around the emissions reductions targets for Ireland coming from the the, the 2030 analysis are relatively ambitious. Particularly as you said, in the context of where agriculture is at the moment and where agriculture is expected to go at the moment. What we do allow in the model is around 300,000 hectares of grassland. Uh, well, first of all, the biomethane is primarily coming from food waste, agricultural waste, different types of uh, uh, and other waste produce. But then there is the issue of land competition. We allow 300,000 hectares of grassland to be available to the model, and the model can basically choose to use that if it's cost effective in terms of, uh, of uh, um, uh, comparing with other technologies. Um, there is the issue, though, around the, the practicality of that actually happening. The, the figure of 300,000 hectares is a figure that we, that we would take from SEAI's bioenergy uh, roadmap. Um, but it's one of those things, I think, that, again, like the, like the gas CCS, warrants a lot more closer ins uh, inspection. Should that land be used for, for agricultural production? Or, again, should it be used for, uh, for biomethane or for, 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 for biogas production? So, again, it's kind of one of those things we could probably look at it from a, from a scenario point of view. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for your uh, talk, Paul. Um, on, on the counter, we're talking about agriculture. I'm just interested in the interplay between that and, uh, say, things like energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. 
given that Ireland's binding carbon target is and will be around a uh, non-ETS sector. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that if agriculture is hard to, or hard to tackle, that that puts pressure back on energy efficiency. And I'm just wondering, um, have you observed any effects on, say, the marginal costs yeah. arising from that? Yeah. Uh, what's going to come true in the model, Cormac, thanks for your question, is, well, energy efficiency always comes true first. Uh, and it's coming through very strongly in the model of a 20% reduction uh, within certain sectors. Again, around the issue of agriculture, is very, is, it's, it becomes very sensitive, and that's where the prices are actually. And that's one of those that risks really going forward for Ireland, is that, okay, you've got certain technology risks, risks around uh, uh, cost of technologies, but it's really the ambition that the model is most sensitive to, particularly in terms of cost. And the ambition really is framed around what happens with agriculture. If we are serious about, uh, let me give you an example, an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, assuming that Irish agriculture stays where it is today and can't reduce emissions, means that the energy system must, re must reduce its emissions by over 100%. Now, that can only be achieved through um, biomass, um, uh, CCS. So I think you're right. It's very, very important for Ireland to understand the implications and the trade-offs when it comes to agriculture, particularly because of the consequence not only for the non-ETS uh, sector, but for the whole economy uh, 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 and energy system at, at a wider scale. Hey, Paul. How are things? Um, <clears throat> just a question, actually, which kind of just follows on from the previous question just there and Jerry's question as well. From the, the drawings you showed there, I was surprised actually to see that by 2050 there's a large level of imports over own indigenous production. Mm. And I suppose on one part, you know, do you look any further as to where those imports are coming from? Mm. You know, it does look at the sustainability of that kind of thing, but not getting too focused on that. Yeah. Um, ultimately, that's going to present a cost. So at the moment, I think it's six and a half billion euros of imports mm. in, in fuel for Ireland roughly a year. Have you looked at how much that would be in terms of, of, of money cost, actually those imports in energy terms themselves? And then second of all to that as well, given the level of, of wind and CCS and everything that you're putting into the model, I know that you're looking at increasing the, the generation capacity you know, by a higher percentage than the current or the, the demand uh, for the peak level. And how is that playing out in terms of price to the end user? So given the current rates of electricity cost to the end user today, you know, does that become extremely prohibitive or, or, or have you looked at that? So uh, first, Roger, in relation to your question around the, the cost of import, so that, that's actually implicit within the model. That comes out in the optimization process. Now, what we do assume within that specific scenario is that those bioenergy imports are suitable in terms of sustainability criteria. If you put a constraint on the model and says, OK, these bioenergy imports are not uh, uh, suitable in terms of sustainability criteria, again, you get a vastly different energy system. Uh, you would be going towards a lot more Renewables, offshore renewables, you'd be going towards almost a kind of, a, and then depending on your level of ambition around CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions, you're kind of t heading towards a hydrogen economy. But the costs, again, are vastly different. So what we display there is the, the cheapest overall system in terms of one scenario, which assumes a certain level of resources are available at a certain level, level of costs. Um, but it is, again, as we highlighted in the conclusion, it is one of those key technology risks are resource risks for Ireland, uh, if it's not available, you do get different, um, uh, different results. In terms of the uh, electricity costs or energy costs for end users, we do work very closely with the ESRI in terms of the, the implications for the economy of these results, looking at the feedback for the economy. We have a research project at the moment in actually feeding energy prices back into the economy and getting a feedback, because if energy prices go up, you're going to have impact on levels of production, uh, and that, of course, then is going to feed back into the energy system. And that's a research project that we have at the moment. In terms of costs, all I can speak of really is in terms of, of, a, of, a, of a proxy for a carbon tax. Um, you're, uh, uh, don't have the figures to hand now at the moment, but the, the, the in, if you're comparing a carbon tax, let's say, in terms of going for 80% um, reduction and 95%, again, you're talking of orders of magnitude, maybe five times greater in terms of a carbon tax. Uh, well done, Paul. It was uh, an absolutely excellent lecture. Um, just one question. I, again, looking at the models, and you just showed us a couple of uh, outputs, obviously, for a model that can kind of do everything, really, in terms of uh, uh, what inputs you put in. Um, have you taken much account of the possibility of um, uh, hydraulic fracking 
in terms of uh, indigenous production? Because obviously you had started by saying that the price of gas in the States had dropped dramatically because of this kind of revolution over pretty well 10 years. And I suppose in particular in relation to the development today that Tamboran looked like they're not going to get a, a license even to drill a test hole yeah. in Northern Ireland. So. Uh, um, I appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, it's a good question. I suppose, well, first of all, in relation to modelling, we do operate under the mantra that all models are completely wrong, um, but some are actually very, very useful. Uh, um, so uh, we do spend a great amount of our time actually scrutinising the results and looking at the results. And again, like any model, in terms of figures, in terms of results, you've got to be very careful in taking those figures in a clear, clear understanding of what the model mathematics actually mean, and again, translating that into the real world. In terms of uh, in terms of, of shale gas, we don't consider directly in the model. There's a number of things that the model does not consider, and we have to kind of infer from the model results. If we're looking at because the model doesn't look at areas around behaviour or so, social social acceptance, uh, the model is weak in those areas. So the way we would translate a kind of a shale gas element within Ireland would be just basically feeding the model a potentially lower gas price and looking at the reaction in in terms of the energy system around that. That's the only way, really, that we could. But we don't do that at the moment, actually. <coughs> Next project, I guess. Next project, yeah. yeah. Along with nuclear, yeah. yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, sorry, just wondering how your model considers resource depletion, um, considering you're looking out to 2050, and one of your very earlier slides had 55 years of gas mm. proven yeah. reserves. Just wondering yeah. how Thanks, that's Nick, considered. Yeah. What the models populate in terms of energy prices would be from the World Energy Outlook, from the IEA. So we do take those energy prices, which, which, which to a certain extent do take a, um, resource completion, which are translated maybe into higher prices. Um, um, so they kind of incorporate it into the model in that regard. Uh, in terms of uh, land resource, um, uh, we would look at things like well, the more bioenergy you develop, you have cost curves, the more expensive it's going to get. In terms of the resource around wind, wind energy, we do take input from the uh, All Island Grid Study, which looked at the available resource for wind in terms of the onshore resource in uh, in the Republic, which is around I think around six uh, six gigawatts. Um, and then the more wind you develop, the cost curves do capture some of the increased cost of the of those development. Um, but maybe t to coming back to your question in terms of maybe the hydrocarbon prices, they would again be implicitly. The, the resource depletion would be assumed implicitly to account for what in the, the, the cost of the fuels themselves. <coughs> if there's no more questions, I might uh, ask David to uh, propose the vote of thanks. Uh, there's no further question, is that? I suppose, um, as you've heard from the audience reaction, we, we've listened to a, a very entertaining uh, account of a, a possible future scenario. I suppose what's very impressive about it were the credentials you set out in the first place uh, in terms of who you are and who you work for and what you've worked with. So, so I think that European perspective that you shared with us was in a way uh, an introduction um, an assertion that we understand current realities and it's in that context that we're making projections or looking at future possibilities. Um, I'm reminded of when modeling first started in Ireland in the energy area and of course that goes back to the NBST and at that time it was a small isolated group of people working on their own talking a very different language and finding it difficult to be heard anywhere outside of the Taoiseach's department <coughs> let alone understood. And uh, I think that's a very important attribute of your second statement, uh, which was localized in Ireland in terms of who you're working with, uh, in terms of other universities, the SRI, and who's funding you, the EPA and SEAI. And what I see there is, again, the legitimacy of legitimizing what you're about to do, but doing it in a way that ensures that the results are communicable are understood by people in those various contexts. So the assumption is that merely by gathering this group of people together, examining these issues and sharing the results, you're already creating an informed community that are in a position to interpret, take, and feed in your messages indirectly and as directly as you might. So I think on those grounds, um, we owe you personally 
and uh, Brian O'Gallagher a great debt for the manner in which uh, you've pursued this whole matter of institutional capability development. I suppose it's always very interesting to look at the prescribed scenario, the 80% reduction scenario, and see what's there. And of course, as we're well aware, these targets are often missed, and the consequences of missing those targets rest with us. Um, you did issue one very clear warning, and it's an important one, that there's a big difference between 80% and 95%. And of course, the other part of that story is there's a big difference between going it alone in the energy sector and sharing it with the agricultural sector. And given you know, the sharpness of focus that that's now come under in Ireland and the understanding of how different we are to the rest of Europe, there's a very clear European policy issue there to make for example, a trading scheme for agriculture or whatever. But of course, no one's going to propose that as long as we have a trading scheme for energy that's working as badly as the current one, and you, you've illustrated it. So um, all of that is not to denigrate anybody's efforts, but just to highlight the enormity of the challenges that are out there. And uh, I think that in itself underlines the importance of the work you're doing, because you're shining a light into a very difficult and contingent area. And um, what was most impressive in your presentation was the very simple question you asked uh, and displayed the answer to is, what will the impact of variable renewable energy be on gas and power generation? So I think to see that result at the 80% level and to see it at the 60% level might inform us about pathways, options, and risks. So uh, with those few comments, uh, I'd like uh, the audience to join me in congratulating you on your presentation and proposing this vote of thanks to you. Thank you.